Now here's a perspective. It seems strange to us that worship and judgment should go together, but this is because, listen up here, if it seems strange to us that worship and judgment would go together in one glorious book, it is because, Wiersbe says, we do not fully understand either the holiness of God or the sinfulness of man. And this is what this book does for us. It gives us an attitude adjustment because we can be just like Jesus' disciples. We can be a little dull in our perception. But we get into this book and it helps us to understand two things. One, the holiness of God. And we better understand that, right? Two, it helps us to understand the sinfulness of man. Now, how many would agree with me that most people walking around in America today do not understand man's sinfulness? It's a crisis. You say, why aren't more people getting saved? Why aren't more people accepting Jesus Christ as their Savior? Uh, because they don't understand their sinfulness. Amen. They think they're okay. So I like what Wiersbe said, and that's why I'm repeating him again. He says, also, nor do we grasp the total picture of what God wants to accomplish, and that's the good part of all this, and how the forces of evil have opposed him. So this is great perspective too. We get to understand how the forces of evil have opposed our God for what he wants to accomplish with his creation. So I don't know about you, but listening to what wears me, I'm ready to pick a side. I'm on God's side. How about you? <laughs> Listen to this. This is the proposition of today's message. I borrowed it from Wearsby. God is long-suffering, but eventually he must judge sin and vindicate his servants. And that's what we see in the book of Revelation. This is what we're going to see today. God is long-suffering, but eventually he must judge sin and vindicate his servants. Now, how bad is our world getting? Why does God have to step in and save the planet? Well, consider Revelation 18.5. It says, for her sins, speaking about the world system that the book of Revelation calls Babylon, her sins have reached unto where? Heaven. Unto heaven. That means a whole lot of wickedness. More wickedness than you and I want to put up with, certainly, than what God would put up with. So, see it up there? Watch this. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. As I said, this statement is concerning the world system that will be in place at the time of Christ's coming. And it's a world system that we see very much formulating right now right before our very eyes. This judgment will come because this Babylonian system, this coming geopolitical empire as described in the book of Revelation 18 where we just read and is first mentioned in the book of Revelation 16, 9. This judgment has, become, has come because the Babylonian system has polluted the whole world. And that's why God has to step in. God is long-suffering, but eventually he must judge sin and vindicate his servants. So our text today is chapter 9, verse 20. Are you there? Man, I got a new Bible out today off my shelf, and the cover's so slick it keeps sliding down. This is crazy. <laughs> So anyway, if I'm a little clumsy up here, uh, don't hold it against me. I won't use this Bible again unless I have some sticky tape on the back. It's really bugging me, but anyways. All right, so Re <laughs> Revelation chapter 9 and uh, verses 20 through 21 tells us uh, the characteristics of this sin that we're talking about that will cause God to judge. And we're going to look at that in just a moment. But first, let's go back to our chart, being we've been away for so long, 
to kind of uh, get reoriented on the basics of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation covers a seven year period, the final seven years of human history, and it's all related chiefly to the nation of Israel. That's God's covenant people initially, that's who he's beholden to, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that, those people. Now we as Gentiles, fortunately, because God's great plan of salvation, we get in on this, and we thank the Lord for that. But this last seven, 70 years is known as Daniel's 70th week. If you're taking notes, you can read all about it in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. We're talking in the book of Revelation, just a seven-year period, and most of it takes place in the final three and a half years. You'll see the mention of 1,260 days. That's when most of this takes place. Where we're at right now in chapter 9 is in this period right here, just before uh, the, the uh, pouring out of the um, sixth trumpet judgment that we're going to see, or that, or that we have seen in chapter 9, and just before the seventh, excuse me. So, what has already happened is the Lord Jesus, in John's vision, has opened the seals of the title deed of planet Earth. He's the only one who has authority to do that. And as he opened that up, that began the progression of the last seven years of history. The first four seals are in Revelation chapter 6. We see about that. And then uh, uh, after that, at the midway point, the Antichrist reveals himself. And there is martyrdom and great tribulation. It's so bad that God's people would be annihilated so God has to cut the great tribulation short. And what he does is when the sixth seal is open, that is cosmic disturbance. That is the sign of Jesus' coming. We see phenomenon in the sky, stars falling, uh, the moon turning blood red, so forth, so forth and so on. And that is the sign of Jesus' coming. It is here that the church is raptured. And then when the seventh seal is open, that begins the day of the Lord's wrath on those who have rejected the Lord and have accepted the Antichrist, and that is the seventh seal. Seventh seal begins the trumpets, and the day of the Lord is this half of the final three and a half period, three and a half years, excuse me, uh, um, 21 months of God's wrath on the world. And fortunately, we, his people, are not around for his wrath because we're not appointed to wrath, right? So that's kind of how that works. So what has happened in chapter 9? Well, the sixth trumpet had been poured out, and what happened was one-third of the world population was killed by these supernatural beings. This is what we saw earlier in Revelation chapter 9, this great judgment the uh, pouring out of the sixth trumpet, the blowing of the sixth trumpet judgment, and uh, it was a terrible situation. Uh, if you look up in chapter 9, it says uh, in verse 18, by these three uh, was the third part of men killed by fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. These supernatural beings that basically work as God's death angels to judge the world. Now we go down to verse number 20, though. This is where we want to come back today and uh, kind of take our time to work out of chapter 9 and then get into chapter 10, the Lord willing, next week. But look at verse 20. All this judgment has been poured out, six trumpets, and it says, and the who? The rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues Yet, what? Repented not. So this is the scenario we see. That time is coming when one third of the world's population will be killed. And that will not change the two thirds that are left. Do you realize that after this, two thirds of the world population will refuse to repent even after all of that? What does it mean to repent? To change their creed or their conduct. They're so hardened against God that all of this judgment 
does not change them and cause them to turn to God. This is a sad theme throughout the book of Revelation. Keep your finger in chapter 9 and go on ahead to chapter 16. We see this repeated. And it must break God's heart because God repeats it three times in chapter 16 alone. Look at verse number 9. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God which had power over these plagues. And they what? Repented not to give him glory. Go on down now to verse number 11. And blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. And what? Repented not of their deeds. Now if you turn to verse number 21. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. I think I heard somewhere else about 100 pounds. And men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hell, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. So they're still blaspheming God. They are still unchanged after all that judgment. Now this is important because when the rapture is seen as taking place somewhere around here, instead of here, where I believe it takes place, according to the clear teaching of Matthew 24, as we can see here, this is all related to the clear teaching of Jesus in the timeline he gives in Matthew 24. But when the rapture is seen as happening here, people get the illusion that there's going to be a lot of people that get saved during this period of time. I don't think we see that in the Bible from what we just read, do we? It says that they repented not during this time. And so I think it's very important to know because a lot of people get lackadaisical about their need to repent right now and get saved because they think, well, when things really, really get bad in the world, then I'll get right with God. That is a crazy assumption. You underestimate the power of the devil to blind and deceive hearts. If we learn anything in what we're studying today, it is not God's judgment that brings sinners to repentance. You can't get any more judgment than what we're reading about right now. One third of the world being killed and they repented not. It is not God's judgment that brings sinners to repentance. It is his love and his goodness that does that. Uh, let's get some scripture on this. Turn, keep your finger in Revelation chapter 9. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and find uh, verse number 8. People are hold, that are holding out to get right with God saying, oh, you know, when I, when I see the Antichrist, then I'll know all this is true and I'll turn to Jesus. Really? Well, let's check out your thoughts with Scripture. Look at verse number 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed, talking about the Antichrist, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all what? Deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not what? The love of the truth that they might be saved. Remember what changes hearts? Judgment? No. God's love changes hearts. If you refuse God's love, your heart won't be changed no matter how much you're judged. What changes man's hearts? God's love, God's goodness. Amen. These, it says, receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They rejected it. So look at the consequence in verse 11. And for this cause, for this reason, God shall send them strong, what? Delusion. Delusion that they should believe a lie. That they, some, all, might be damned who believe not the truth and have pleasure in unrighteousness. So we kind of see Paul predicts that there will be so much deception in the power of the Antichrist, that if they have not received the love of the truth, they will have a strong delusion come on them.
and they will believe a lie. So if people refuse the goodness and love of God now, it's highly unlikely that this judgment that we're seeing in the book of Revelation would produce salvation in them. In 10 days. Again, uh, this is a hard book, but see, we get perspective. And this helps us to have a burden for people and realize that our time is getting short. As I mentioned, uh, I'm, I put together a little team that goes out with me in the, the, the neighborhoods of Norwalk, and we knock on doors, and we're, we're pleading with people, get right now before it's too late. Receive the love of the truth now. Because look what Paul says. Here's a paraphrase of Romans 2, 4 through 5. This is telling. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to do what? Turn you from your sin. You from your sin. Next verse. But because you are stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, you are storing up terrible punishment for yourself. For a day of God's of anger, a day, for a day of anger or wrath is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Don't you see how kind and wonderfully t tolerant how kind, tolerant, and patient God is, and yet they don't repent. So, back to Revelation 9 and verse 20. We saw the disposition of men even after great judgment. The rest of the men, the two-thirds of the population of the world that is remaining on earth, that hasn't been raptured or killed, the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet, re yet repented not. Repented not of what? Well, here in verse 20 we see uh, the nature and the extent of their sinfulness and why God will bring judgment upon the world even further. They repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. So this is the sins that has reached up to heaven, and God has remembered it, and God is going to correct it once and for all. This is their sins and the extent of the sinfulness. A pretty bad rap sheet. Murder, sorcery, fornication, thefts. That's wickedness. That's evil. That is crime against humanity. Grievous stuff. And so we see, first of all, from the second part of verse 20, God's judgment will be poured out because of the sin of what? Idolatry. idolatry. God's judgment is going to be poured out on the idolatry of the world. God hates idolatry. Now what about idolatry in the 21st century? Well, whatever form it is in, Whatever God they look to, whatever thing they trust in, the thing that we must know, no matter how simple it looks on the surface, if it's just an image that sits on their porch that they worship, we've got to understand the demonic powers behind it. And so, as we think of the last times, it might seem strange to us that there will be a proliferation of idolatry in the world, it's like, has the world kind of outgrown this? Strangely not. And with the Christian influence becoming less and less, idolatry will become more and more because that's what they will turn to when they have not the truth.
That's the natural inclination of darkened hearts. We read about this in Romans chapter what? Romans chapter what? One. Darkens hearts. So the reason why we see the mention of idolatry is because with demonic powers abounding at the end of the world, it should not surprise us that there will still be idolatry happening and God hates it. It reaches up to heaven and he remembers this iniquity. Now the thing I say again that we need to understand from the Bible is, you know, um, idolatry is not just the way they choose to worship God. If you believe something like that, you're grossly naive. It is not just the way they choose to worship God. Deuteronomy 32, 17 says unequivocally and categorically that the power behind idols is demonic power. Read this out loud with me. They sacrifice to demons, not to God. To gods they did not know, to new gods, new arrivals that your fathers did not know. When they sacrifice to these idolatrous gods, who are they really... Oh, I got a pointer now. I don't need to reach. When they, when, they, when they worship these gods, what is the power behind that? Demons. Demons empower idolatry. And that's what we need to understand. All right? So it's repugnant to the true and living God. To show you how much God hates it, there was a night when God decided he was going to judge the ancient Babylonian Empire. And he would allow in a miraculous way for that great kingdom to be overrun in one night. And Daniel, of course, is there. And the king, Belshazzar, has a vision that foretells his demise, his ruin. And, of course, Daniel's a prophet, so he beckons Daniel, and Daniel could do nothing but give him this rebuke. But I want you to concentrate on this rebuke because I want you to see how much God hates idolatry. Daniel said to Belshazzar shortly before his death and the overthrowing of the Babylonian kingdom by the Mers and Medes and Persians. He says in Daniel 5.23, if you're taking notes, for you have proudly defied the Lord of heaven and have had these cups from his temple brought before you. You and your nobles and your wives and concubines have been drinking wine from them while praising gods of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, gods that neither see nor hear nor know anything at all, just like we read in Revelation chapter 9. But everybody read this out loud with me together. But you have not honored the God who gives you the breath of life and controls your destiny. Why is idolatry so grievous? Because it doesn't honor the God who gives us the breath of life. That's egregious. There's only one reason you have a pulse right now. It's because of Almighty God. And He needs to be acknowledged in our life every minute, every day, 24-7. He needs, in the best that we can, uh, even though we're in the flesh, we need to honor Him. Because Daniel said to Belshazzar, it is the living and true God who gives you the breath of life and controls your destiny. In other words, Belshazzar, the only reason you have this kingdom is because God permitted it. And you're mocking him and defying him and taunting him by taking that which was sacred, the cups of God's temple, and having uh, an orgy and drunkenness and worshiping your idols. So we see the final straw for God concerning idolatry happens in the book of Revelation when the whole world who is under strong delusion will collectively worship a man. This is the final straw for God. The world rejects his Christ, and worships a man. And how bad does it get in the worship of the Antichrist? They will make images of him. 
and people will have the image of the Antichrist and be actively engaged worshiping him who is only a Satan-filled man. That's the last curtain with God. Yeah, are you shocked to see idolatry in the book of Revelation? You shouldn't be, because look at the, the image thing that is going to happen in relation to the Antichrist. Turn to chapter 13, if you will, and find verse number 14. Speaking of the Antichrist and the false prophet, and deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make a what? Amen. What do we call that? Make an image, an idol to the beast, which have the wound by the sword and live. Oh, beloved, make no mistake about it, this book gives us perspective. There will be a whole lot of idolatry coming on in the future. And the image will be who? The Antichrist. Look at verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So, John was really ahead of his, his time. He was writing in about 95 AD, and evidently, he kind of had privy to the idea of Alexa. And cell phones. Because he says that there will be inanimate objects that are images of the Antichrist that will have the ability to what? Speak. Speak. Have you ever wanted to kill Alexa? All of a sudden she talks when you didn't beckon her and it scares you half to death? So we see in this day and age that there are inanimate things that speak. And is the Antichrist going to use technology through the image to help people in their daily devotions of worshiping him? We just don't know. I don't know how it's all going to work out. Don't ask me. I'm just saying I think John was ahead of his time. Anybody agree with poor Pastor Tom? Images talking. All right. Um, go on over to chapter 14. God is repeating this. Verse 9, And the third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his what? Image. Image, his idol, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment is ended up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image. image. And whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. It's mentioned again also in chapter 16 and verse 2 if you're taking notes. So what did Wearsby say to us? He said, we do not understand the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man. Do you realize when there is a Bible available to people in almost every language, how terrible it is that men still insist on doing exactly what King Belshazzar did and not honoring the God who gives them the breath of life and controls their destiny? Don't be wimpy, beloved. This world is worthy of judgment. They do not honor the God who gives them the breath of life. That is utterly sinful. That is utterly unacceptable. That deserves judgment because they refuse to repent. They will not change their creed or their conduct. Remember we saw that. So we put this up on our church sign. And obviously it didn't cause a hundred people to come in in adulation of our stand. And... People were like, whoa, Pastor Tom, 
you're a bad boy preacher with that sign. I'd say it wasn't me. I got this from Billy Graham of all people. But repeat this after me, let's read it together. The world that has rejected God's Christ is ready to receive the devil's Christ even if it means becoming idolatrous and worshiping his image. If you said image, you're my class pet today. That's what I was looking for. I wanted to hear you say image. That ought to help yourself, image. You're the pastor's pet. So, as we end uh, up on our treatment of verse number 20, now you can see why I wanted to come back and talk about it a little more, because I did a really lame job last time. I kind of had to take a half of a sleeping pill after last time. I was like, you did terrible on finishing that chapter. You didn't even stay within the context. You sounded like a dorky pastor. I said, i got to get back to this. So I took a half of a sleeping pill and hoped for this day, and here it is. But it really wasn't a sleeping pill. It was some um, big guy. No, it wasn't a Tic Tac. I saved those for in the morning. That's when I really need them when I wake up, not when I go to sleep. That's when you have Tic Tacs. Um, manager, who said that? Which Dobson girl said it? Oh, the younger Dobson. Thank you. All right, so <laughs> we have a lot to talk about. As we finish up verse 20, uh, let this get in your mind. Who or what it is that we really trust? Ask that question. Who or what is it that we really trust? In answering that question, we find who or what our God is. And these people will be trusting the Antichrist. The Antichrist is their God. Secondly, we saw already that God's judgment will be poured out because of idolatry, but in verse 21, we see that God's judgment will be poured out because of what? Immorality. immorality. Look at verse number 21. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Here's a list of how many sins. Four. And every one of them, including the one before that, idolatry, every one of them are clear um, violations of the Ten Commandments. And we're not talking about something that is hard here. We're talking about something that kindergarten kids could understand that God says not to do. And with defiance and glee, Man continues to do that, to completely obliterate the authority of God's Ten Commandments. How many have seen that? The world keeps getting worse and worse, and everybody's saying, who's going to help us? How's this going to get better? But all the while, they violate God's Ten Commandments over and over again. So simple, so easy to understand. So easy to respect because they come from God, but no. And we're seeing this worldwide perhaps no more blatantly than in the area of sexual behavior. 1 Corinthians 7 2 says very clearly to avoid what? Fornication. Fornication. Let every man have his own wife. And let every woman have her own husband. How easy is that? How many people do you know live by that rule today? What would you say is a percentage? 25% or less? Anybody think higher than 25%? I certainly don't think so. Worldwide. And... What this is creating, again, in the devil's system, is when people don't live according to Ten Commandments, God's Ten Commandments, you know what it creates in the world? It creates poverty. 
You know, the poorest people in the world are the ones that do not obey God's Ten Commandments. And now it's, it's uh, uh, epidemic. And we wonder why the world is having so many problems. The world is trying to make life work without God's Word. The world is trying to make life work without Christ. And all it's doing is playing into the trap of the Antichrist. It's making people more and more poor, more and more desperate, more and more fearful. And yet a popular radio personality has started a campaign. And it's very interesting to listen to him in this campaign. And other people are jumping on board. He's saying that if people did this, there would be practically a zero poverty rate. Other people have said it would be 75% successful against poverty. But it's called the success sequence. And this is what he says. You can guarantee that every kid in America will not be poor if they do these three things. One, graduate from high school. Two, don't have a kid before you are 25 years old. And three, get married. Back up to 1 Corinthians 7, 2. What does Paul tell us? Get married. Avoid fornication. Let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. So when we see these sins, we see that it plays right into what the world system is wanting to do, create a situation of poverty through fornication that will cause everybody to be eating out of the hand of the government. And it is the sole reason for much of the poverty, if not almost all of the poverty we see in America. Again, study this out. Go online, look up the Brookings Institute, and you will see that the statistics have been studied and analyzed, and there is 25% less, and this guy says 0%, if these three things would only be done that are in line with the Ten Commandments, graduate from high school, that generally means you're honoring your father and your mother, don't have a kid before you are 25 years old, that means you're not sleeping around, having casual sex all the time, and get married. Which brings us to our third point. And this is where I really get concerned and actually, to be honest with you, a little bit angry. Well, you can ask First Lady. To be really honest, not a little bit angry, very, very angry. Is when I look at these sins in verse 21, and I've looked at them a lot. When I look at these sins in verse 21, I understand that God's judgment will be poured out because these sins have become institutionalized. The thing that has me scratching my head, even though it doesn't end, itch, is I see that this description of sin that is listed in verse 21 is now being promoted and facilitated by governments, by corporations, by schools, by media, by the entertainment industry, even by professional sports leagues. They are promoting and facilitating these kinds of sins. For instance, we look at that word sorceries. Put your index finger under that word. That is the Greek word pharmakia, where we get our word pharmacy. Would you not agree that for some strange reason, Big Pharma is trying to take over the world? How come there, we are being, having pharmacia pushed on us all the time. And we can only see that it's going to, uh, they have established themselves as a juggernaut in the world society. They're only going to get stronger and stronger and they will be used like witchcraft to get people to worship the Antichrist. There's such a dependency on pharma. People are basing their whole life survival on pharma. Pharma is their idol. 
and the Antichrist is going to give them pharmakia, it will be sorcery, it will have the effects of witchcraft. So this is what I'm telling you, these sins are institutionalized. That's why I had to come back and do a redo on this, Brother Fetter, because in my bad job of this, I made these sins look like just individual matters. It'd be bad enough if they were individual matters. These are institutionalized governments, the media, schools. It's all being pushed on our innocent children to the point where they are becoming indoctrinated to conform to this world system. Do you know what I'm talking about? Speaking of the Dotson girl, she called my wife up and saw information of what our governor's doing, and she couldn't believe it. Which brings me to this sin in here. I'm looking and I see this sin fornication, and I have to ask the question, why is the government so interested in our kids and sexuality? We have a young man that grew up in this church. He was part of our youth group. I coached him in football. He's running for state assembly. He went to John Glenn High School. He found out that John Glenn High School during the summer was trying to, in the quiet of summer, through the school board, sneak in a Planned Parenthood uh, operation at John Glenn High School. You know what that means? That means without parental consent, these kids would be having all kinds of life-changing things happen to them at school, being pushed by counselors and whatever. Well, Raul Ortiz, who's running for state assembly, he found out about it because that was his alma mater at one point. He didn't finish there. He finished here. And he got a protest together. And our people mobilized. Sister Melissa was there. I appreciate that, sister. And the protest was so great on that hot summer night that the school district took it off the agenda and then took it off of their plans. But I'm like, since when... When schools are supposed to be teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic, since when is it the school's job to create Planned Parenthood on their campus? You say, well, our kids need medical attention. What was the Affordable Care Act for? What are we paying billions of dollars to the Affordable Care Act for? Isn't that for the treatment of kids? So what, how's Planned Parenthood fit in with this when we have Obamacare? It fits in one way, for abortion. Abortion for our kids, that's what it's all about. They can get their health needs met through the insurance that the government provides through Obamacare. And so they closed it down. Good for Raul Ortiz. I hope he wins the election. He deserves it after that. But I'm asking the question, why has the government become so interested in our kids' sexuality? Why aren't they teaching marriage in the school? Why are they handing out condoms? They like this idea in the world system of fornication because fornication creates poverty and poverty creates dependence on Big Brother. Amen. And you really need to see this, folks. Some of you are too namby-pamby because you don't have God's perspective. You've got to get the perspective. You've got to get with the program. This wickedness is going to cause God to immediately eradicate one third of the world population. You better get on his side and understanding how wicked this world is. This world is mutilating our children, pushing on them gender confusion. Chemical castration without parental consent. Radical mastectomies without parental consent. It is total wickedness. And we can't stand by and allow it to happen. Who's on board with it? Governments, corporations, schools, media, professional sports league. What happens if you speak out against it? You get canceled. You get doxxed. You say, how do you know? Because I have been. You get slandered. You might even get physically attacked. The strong delusion has started already. What does Ecclesiastes 9.3 say? Read it for me. 
There is a madness in their hearts while they live. A kind of madness has gripped the human race. You know, want to know why the madness has gone wild? Because the church has just about been put into extinction. Because there are so many pastors, you can ask my dear sister Katerina about this. There's so many pastors who are unwilling to take a stand. That's right. I'm saying it on Facebook. Pastors, you're wimps. I'm ashamed to call you a colleague. So many pastors are not taking stands. And so what's happening? This madness has gone wild. And we are seeing nothing but unadulterated insanity on a geopolitical level. And that's why God has to step in. What is it doing? What is the delusion accomplishing? Well, sex, the state, science, and society, these are the idols of our day, and this is what will cause people to worship the image of the Antichrist. I promise you, these things that people are replacing for the authority of God's Word, these meager, pathetic things of sex, state, science, and society, these idols are nothing more than a gateway to their ultimate sin of idolatry, and that is the worship of a man, the coming Antichrist, who Paul interestingly calls the man of sin. Boy, Sandy, you picked quite a Sunday to come back. I'm blaming it on you. The reason this is going, going this direction is because Sandy's here. But let me finish up, and thank you for listening so courteously. But let's talk about tonight at sundown. Tonight at sundown begins the final of the great Jewish fall feasts, holidays. We were here on the Sunday when on sundown they would be celebrating Rosh Hashanah, the day of atonement, excuse me, the Jewish New Year. Then last Tuesday at sundown, um, and when we were praying Wednesday, they were in the midst of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. So they had their New Year and their day of atonement, and tonight at sundown they start their final fall festival. It's the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot. And this is where they build those, um, what do we call those things? Booths. Like makeshift little forts that they eat in. It's, it's to remember that God brought them through the wilderness into the Promised Land. But it's also a picture of the millennium of the Messiah's reign. That's what Sukkot pictures, the millennial reign of Christ. <laughs> So, when we had the Jewish New Year, September 25th, that became the Jewish year of 5783. You say, where do they get this number 5783? They think it's been that many years since the creation of man. So, when you see their year, their Jewish New Year is 5783. Well... As we think about their Sukkot beginning at sundown tonight, what's so significant about this holiday that relates to their messianic aspirations is um, they believe that the messianic kingdom will come in the year 6000. So they're at 5783. What does that mean? They have 217 more years to wait for the Messiah to come and bring the kingdom. That's longer than I want to wait. So I would respond like this. The Jews were wrong about Christ's first coming. I don't trust him on his second coming. And so I think it's even closer. How about you? I don't think we have to wait 217 years. I think madness is in the heart of man. And the Holy Spirit is not being allowed to change that. The Holy Spirit is being pulled out by their idolatry and their wrongness. And so the madness is increasing and increasing, and I think just like what we see, God has to step in to save the planet, to save humankind. And so we could be a whole lot closer than the Jews would think for Christ's kingdom, because this is what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 37. 
When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in whose days? Noah's days. Noah's days. What does Genesis tell us about Noah's days? Genesis 6.11 tells us Noah's days were like this. The earth also was what? Corrupt. Corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with... Does it sound like our earth? How many say, Pastor, I didn't understand everything you said today, but I agree with Jesus, we're living in the days of Noah. If this is the days of Noah, we're there. Hands again. Amen. Wonderful. Well, what about this word violence? Noah, in his Webster's 1828 dictionary, uses this verse as an example of his definition of violence in this sense. And look what he says about it. Violence, the synonym of it would be what? Outrage. Outrage. Remember our preacher last week talked about the fact that people think man, men can have babies now? Outrage. Unjust force. You do what we tell you to do. And crimes of all kinds. The violence of Noah's day was crimes of all kinds. Unjust force. The government is becoming so encroaching. We didn't get a chance to talk about thefts. Do you know that the governments of the world are planning on taking away our personal property? You can read the World Economic Forum, their aspiration for the world utopia that they want to create. I read it on their website. It says, one day, nobody will own anything and be happy. Yeah. So that sounds great. We'll be happy. We don't have to own anything. God make us happy. Utopia. Let's go for it. Wait a minute. God is a God that blesses personal property. If he wasn't, he wouldn't have in the Ten Commandments, you shall not steal. Human beings deserve the dignity of ownership of things. Personal property is part of our human dignity, part of our reward for working diligently. Amen? Amen. The government plans on taking it all away from you. Thefts. You say, oh, you're just reading that book. No, it's happening all the time, right, in our country. Do you realize there's one man and he's rather old. And I kind of wonder sometimes if he's thinking straight. There's one man. He's over 80. And his name is Joe Biden. And you know what he decided to do? He decided that he was going to pay off student loans. I'm like, with whose money, Uncle Joe? Our money. You know what that is? If you take my money to pay off someone else's loan, that is theft. Amen. What about the money I paid for school? Why don't I get any? Why is it just these people now? That is one man in government abusing his authority, abusing his position, and stealing. And if you think Joe's bad, wait till you see the Antichrist. That's why the word theft is in there. Thank you, everybody. I've got to finish. Wow, you did so wonderfully. Thank you for hanging in there with me. Um, we went a little long, but we had to get back in the flow of, book, of the book of Revelation. And so I appreciate your, your patience. And let's turn to 392, and we'll just let you respond to God's word, singing this in your heart to the Lord, and making this sort of your commitment now that we've heard